Hello, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the ESSD for the invitation to speak at this year's meeting. My job today is to discuss the possibility that non-invasive technologies may have utility for detecting aspiration or other features of dysphagia. I do have a few disclosures as listed on this slide. And I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge my fabulous team at the Steel Swallowing Lab at the Kite Research Institute of the University Health Network in Toronto. To put this topic in context, we need to begin by acknowledging the reasons why people want to find a non-invasive technology that can accurately detect swallowing impairment. These reasons start with the fact that non-instrumental clinical swallowing examinations are observational and rely on clinical inference, and that these inferences may both under-identify and over-identify concerns like aspiration in comparison to instrumental exams. But those instrumental exams are often expensive and difficult to access. I can tell you that the idea of developing a non-invasive technology to overcome limitations in access to video fluoroscopy is the number one research idea that prospective students from countries like India, Iran, Korea, and Egypt put forward to me when they approach me regarding possible doctoral studies. And this sort of idea is certainly not new. Those of you like me who grew up in the 1970s and 1980s may remember the original Star Trek TV series in which the tricorder appeared as a futuristic medical diagnostic device that could non-invasively scan a person and come up with an accurate diagnosis. And we have seen huge advances in other areas of medical technology. So what about swallowing? The real challenge that we dream of overcoming is the fact that unlike the $6 million man, another character in a TV series from the 1970s, we do not have bionic eyes or X-ray vision. And unfortunately, there are many aspects of swallowing that are not outwardly visible as shown on this slide. And so the vision is that a technology might be developed that can accurately detect penetration aspiration and or pharyngeal residue. And a number of technologies have been explored so far, including surface electromyography, nasal cannula measures of airflow, ultrasound, acoustics, accelerometry, and piezoelectric sensors. But so far, nobody has succeeded in developing a successful and accurate non-invasive diagnostic technology for detecting dysphagia. Along the way, however, we have learned a lot about the performance criteria that need to be met by such a technology and the challenges that need to be overcome. So I'd like to talk through these challenges. First, it is critical that a technology be fully understood in terms of what it does measure and what it does not measure. Related to this, we need to be able to explain the signals or information that are shown on the output of a non-invasive device in terms of the underlying physiology that those signals represent. Once we are clear about that physiological source, we then need evidence to show that this physiology is clearly associated with the problem that we are trying to measure. If we spend energy developing a device that tracks some aspect of swallowing that is actually not strongly predictive of penetration, aspiration, or residue, then our efforts have been wasted. Once we have decided on the signals that we want to collect, we then need to know how to find the portions of those signals that contain swallowing events of interest. This is called segmentation, and it is not necessarily an easy challenge to overcome with accuracy and reliability. One of the major reasons that segmentation can be challenging is the fact that these signals frequently contain artifacts and noise that can either be mistaken for swallowing activity or may mask swallowing related information. And the final challenge, which is probably the biggest barrier to the development of these technologies, 
is that accuracy in detecting swallowing impairment needs to be demonstrated based on direct comparison to an accepted and valid gold standard criterion reference. And that almost certainly means that we need to collect lots and lots of simultaneous video fluoroscopy data and rate that with rigorous methods. So let's discuss some of the limitations that we have discovered along the way. Beginning with surface EMG, there is lots of evidence that this technology can be used to measure the timing and amplitude of muscle contraction. However, when we apply this to swallowing, we have to remember that swallowing involves somewhere in the order of 25 to 30 pairs of muscles that contract in a pattern sequence, and that while some of those muscles do lie relatively close to the skin, such that we could measure their activity with surface EMG electrodes, others lie much deeper. And unfortunately, studies have not shown that measuring the activity of the suprahyoid muscles is sufficient for knowing what will happen in terms of the pharyngeal constrictor muscles or the thyroarytenoid or the cricopharyngeus. So this technology provides an incomplete picture. Additionally, we know that the amplitude of EMG signals varies as a function of the amount and density of tissue that lies between the sensor and the underlying muscles of interest so that there are actually no available norms to enable easy comparison across people. Another technology where we have encountered limitations is ultrasound. And here we know that the signal travels well through tissue, but degrades when it comes into contact with air. And given that we are most interested in knowing what happens in the air-filled regions of the laryngeal vestibule, the glottis, and the trachea, this limitation makes it inherently unlikely that ultrasound will be useful for detecting penetration or aspiration. However, it does have utility for observing and tracking movement. So if we can identify kinematic biomarkers that are sufficient predictors of penetration aspiration, then there is the possibility that ultrasound could be used for monitoring those proxy behaviors. One of the most debated technologies with respect to evaluating swallowing is the use of cervical auscultation to listen to the sounds of swallowing. Here, there is some evidence that clinicians who listen to swallowing acoustics do have some ability to differentiate swallows that do or do not involve aspiration. But so far, we have not managed to clearly pinpoint what the acoustic characteristics are that led to those interpretations. And our failure to do this, to identify those aspects of the acoustic signal that carry that key information so that we could then teach a device to focus on those features, means that this technology has not yet met the necessary performance criteria to be considered a valid technology for use in swallowing assessment. One of the major challenges that cervical auscultation has not overcome is the fact that the microphones that are used to collect the acoustic signal also pick up a great deal of noise and artifact, which probably cannot be successfully filtered out by the human ear and would need to be properly filtered out by machine algorithms. Another challenge that is common to all of these technologies is the fact that the sampling frequencies are often very different from the 25 or 30 frames per second that we are able to collect during video fluoroscopy, which is the most likely reference standard that will be used. So clearly linking events in these non-invasive signals to corresponding events in video fluoroscopy is not straightforward. Accelerometry is another technique that is also referred to using the term cervical auscultation and more recently the term high resolution cervical auscultation. But accelerometry measures vibrations rather than acoustics. There are actually quite a number of articles over the past 15 years exploring this technology. But so far, we are still not completely certain 
what the physiological source of that signal is. The majority of studies have pursued the idea that the most likely source of the signal detected by an accelerometer that is placed over the cricoid notch is hyolaryngeal excursion. And data support this idea showing correlations between both the vertical and horizontal axes of the acceleration signal and measures of superior and anterior hyoid displacement and speed. Several labs, most notably the lab of Dr. Urban Sedich, who was at the University of Pittsburgh and has recently relocated to the University of Toronto, have shown good success in predicting the location of the hyoid bone on video fluoroscopy based on accelerometry signal data. This sort of success offers some promise that we may be able to use accelerometry signals to detect aspects of underlying swallowing kinematics that are predictors of penetration aspiration and or residue. And indeed, the Sedich lab has recently published two papers suggesting that anterior peak position of the hyoid may be one of those predictors, although sensitivity and specificity for detecting penetration aspiration based on hyoid kinematics is not as strong as we might wish. In 2019, I led the publication of results for a study sponsored by Nestle Health Science in which we collected simultaneous accelerometry data and video fluoroscopy with the goal of training algorithms to successfully classify whether a signal represented penetration aspiration or not. This study was conducted in a prospective sample of 305 adults with risk for neurogenic dysphagia in which it made sense to collect a video fluoroscopy. And as you can see from the graph on the right-hand side of the screen, we were able to train algorithms to accurately detect penetration aspiration with a sensitivity of 86%, a specificity of 60%, and an area under the curve of 0.82. And on this basis, we then proceeded on to a second validation study in a new sample. This graph shows you the frequency of penetration aspiration on thin liquids in the first of those two studies, which was called the sonar study. You can see that only a small number of thin liquid boluses, that is 7.2%, coming from 23% of the study participants, had penetration aspiration scale scores of three or worse. This was actually partly by design because examples of both safe and unsafe swallowing are needed to train an algorithm to detect penetration aspiration. But this skew towards safe swallowing led us to target a more acute group of patients for the subsequent validation study so that we would have more examples of unsafe swallowing. And we achieved that as shown here for the 193 stroke patients in that second trial, which was called the Porsche study, where about one third of the thin liquid data was classified as unsafe, coming from 105 of those participants. Unfortunately, however, the interim results of applying the sonar algorithms to the Porsche data did not achieve the same level of performance. And because of this, the validation trial was terminated. However, the process of training and testing these algorithms also showed us something very important that really emphasizes the need for direct rather than indirect validation of device algorithm results. This graph shows you the number of participants in the SONAR trial who displayed penetration aspiration scale scores of concern on each of the six thin liquid boluses that were presented. You can see that on bolus number one, 8% of the participants showed a score of concern. On bolus number two, 7% more of the sample showed their first penetration aspiration event of concern, raising the total to 15%. On the third bolus, 3% more of the sample showed a problem. And on the fourth bolus, 4% more if the sample showed their first problem. This is really critical data because it tells us that people who have penetration aspiration 
do not display the problem consistently across different boluses. And for this reason, when we train and develop device algorithms to detect penetration aspiration, we really need to compare the device results to the truth for each and every bolus. The predictive accuracy of a device algorithm should be evaluated using a two by two contingency table, plotting the test result against the truth, that is the presence or absence of the target underlying problem on the reference test, in this case, video fluoroscopy. And this allows us to calculate meaningful indices such as sensitivity, specificity, and negative predictive value. And in order for a new diagnostic method to have true clinical utility, it should score well on all three of those indices. But usually, these statistics are reported at the level of the person. That is, did the person show any single problem across the swallows measured using the device? And did that result agree with whether or not they showed any single problem across the swallows measured in the reference test? And a big problem in our literature is that the number of swallows and the types of boluses that are evaluated in the first test, in this case, the device test, is often quite different than the number or type of swallows that are collected during the reference test, which is often performed separately on a different occasion. And when we do this, we're actually comparing the results of two different tests and making an error of assumption that the results should agree across those two different testing contexts. Our results showing inconsistent penetration aspiration on a bolus by bolus basis in the sonar study suggest that this approach of indirect comparison inflates the possibility that the two tests will agree. To illustrate, let's imagine a scenario involving six thin liquid boluses where the results of the device show a problem on the fourth bolus. Now let's imagine that those same swallows were actually collected simultaneously using video fluoroscopy and information from the video fluoroscopy analysis suggests that there was a penetration aspiration problem on the second bolus. If the statistics that are used to compare those two tests look at the net results across the six boluses, they will both agree that there was penetration aspiration. However, the details suggest that that agreement is actually based on two cases of disagreement. On bolus number two, where the device failed to detect a genuine penetration aspiration event, and also on bolus number four, where the device incorrectly flagged penetration aspiration that did not actually occur. This kind of mismatch in details, but apparent agreement in net results, is something we need to be very vigilant in watching for during device development and testing. For this reason, I believe the standard for diagnostic accuracy should be based on direct validation using simultaneous instrumental testing at the bolus level. So with that, I will wrap up by saying that the idea of a non-invasive device that can be used to accurately detect penetration aspiration or residue still remains an elusive dream at this point. Research over the past decade has taught us a lot about the limitations of these potential technologies, and it's important for us to understand those limitations. It's also really important for us to remember that identification of a problem is only the first step in swallowing assessment and does not give us sufficient information about the underlying mechanisms of those impairments to guide treatment planning. I hope that this wish list of performance criteria is something that will be helpful for you when reading the literature and also when designing your own studies regarding novel technologies. I thank you all for your attention and look forward to discussion during the question and answer session.